Hello, and welcome to Therapist Plays Disco Elysium. On today's episode, we're exploring more across the waterlock and getting to know some new characters in Fishing Village, namely Lelianne and the Washerwoman. And in talking to them, we're going to explore how much a person's identity is shaped by the environment that they live in and how having a sense of presence and place to communicate to someone else is one of the fundamental ways that we start to connect. The game just keeps surprising me with how deep we can go into these subjects from very minimal conversations at times. So I'm really excited to keep going on this journey with you all and meeting lots of new characters. So let's jump in. Okay. So <laughs> our last episode was, uh, it really like resonated with me. Um, yeah, someone pointed out like in a couple of episodes before this one, I was talking about how like frustrated I've been with Kim that he's like, he's not understanding me. Like <laughs> he's, he's making fun of me. He's, uh, it doesn't feel like he's sympathetic to the things that I'm, that our character is sympathetic to, like talking to Kuno or it's like things that he's like, you're wasting time with this and to me and to my character they are like the essential work of our self-discovery and our healing right and it's kind of fitting that like our character sees a very narrow range of like kim's intentions he sees that surface like uh not rejection but like lack of comparable interest let's say in doing some of these things like talking to Kuno and and he sees that as like a lack of support from Kim or a lack of understanding when in reality when you zoom out a bit like Kim affords us so much willingness to understand um, but it's it's this it's it's different things he's clearly willing to understand the like lack of identity, shame, um, fear of not living up to who we used to be or being a person that was good at some things but lost confidence in himself and you know his health started to get worse and worse. Those are things that he, you know, potentially relates to. And so he's very empathetic towards. The reason I bring that up is because sometimes you have this experience where, like, if I become someone who has a hard time trusting others, right, which I've been kind of, like, role-playing, or like at least leading into that, uh, leaning into that character trait, I have a hard time trusting someone, I tend to put up a mask, right? because I don't want to show people like my more vulnerable side because showing it to someone has um, caused some heartbreak in the case of like Harry and his ex-partner we presume based on what information I know so the less trusting we are the more we put on this front and for us it's like the super cap right and sometimes because we are wearing that mask of not trusting, we, we look to other people and we're always detecting whether they are being honest as well, right? And I've seen this happen many times that we will see someone else who looks like they're wearing a facade, which we have seen in Kim sometimes where we're like, how can you not be understanding of me? Um, and we don't realize that they're also wearing that same mask that they've also been through some things that showing their most vulnerable side also has shown them that it leads to heartbreak or rejection or, or shame in some way. And so you have two people who both feel like there's no one in the world who could ever understand them. And each of them wear a mask that covers that 
And when you see someone else who looks like that, you're not aware because you're only seeing the facade, the same one that you're wearing. And here is someone who you actually have the greatest capacity to relate to, and you see them as someone who's not trustworthy because you see them wearing a mask, but it's the same mask you have. So I find that really interesting. I feel like that's kind of what our relationship, my specific relationship, I'm talking about like the game itself, like how they wrote this, but this has been like my playthrough, my my experience with Kim. We we are both challenged by like the the more inner vulnerable parts of ourselves and Kim wears the mask of professionalism and we wear the mask of like the fantasy super cop. And he looks at our mask and says, you're not really a super cop. Why are you being delusional? And we look at his professional mask and we're like, why aren't you in touch with your humanity? You know, you just seem to be at work. And yet we're the same. We're both wearing a mask. So I'm just, I'm loving their dynamic the more and more we um, spend time together. Okay. That's enough fucking around, though. I, every time I, I have been saying this for like 20 episodes at this point, I need to solve this murder. I need to make progress on the case. I know that's not really the point. The point is it's like everything else, but <laughs> we, need, we need to move forward on this case. Footprints in the snow. They lead away from the axis. Oh, that could be my footprints. Here I go again. <laughs> I just how the boat has been recently tarred. Okay. I gotta, I gotta click these orbs so I can level up. So I can talk to uh, Titus. But yeah, mask wearing is a very interesting um, discussion psychologically. A lot of people get discouraged when, whenever I bring up masks because they're like, oh, well, I don't want to wear a mask or I don't like people who wear them. And it's like, well, we all wear them. Like, I'm wearing my streamer mask right now. Like, it's not the same mask I wear when I'm at work. You know, I'm a little more serious, less goofing off, <laughs> less vulgar. Um, and, like, I wear a different mask when I, you know, talk to family members or a loved one or whatever. Like, you know, you're, you're going to be shifting your presentation, your tone of voice, your style of speech, little bits and bits. And as long as you're aware of that, there's nothing wrong with it. Um... It's when you're not aware of it. When when wearing the mask becomes compensatory for like being unaware of the vulnerability underneath it, that it becomes problematic. Who's, what are these doing in the fish? Let's, let's try to see. Got a fisherman. Let's check this out. We got some boots. <laughs> okay, some some boots that'll give us some some perceptive skills. I feel like uh, that's appropriate for us to wear right now. Our composure is kind of okay. Let's pop those bad boys on. We could stand to be a little perceptive. Let's check out what's in this box. Let's perceive it. Cash! We're well on our way to uh, residential security for the night. Okay. Click one more little orb, and then I'll talk to this fishing person. Hi, officer. A woman in a raincoat stands on the quay, considering an overturned boat. A sword in the scabbard hangs from her hip. Lillian, the net picker. Okay, Lillian. Anything I can help you with? I swear to God, if I am about to encounter, like, the thing I just talked about <laughs> with, like, people wearing masks and them actually being very vulnerable underneath. I swear to God, if it happens again where I talk about it and then it literally happens, I'm gonna freak out. Uh, where are we exactly? A fishing village on the seashore. This place doesn't really have a name. It's sometimes called Illicible. Illicible, why? The sign on the street leading here is illegible. Has been since they built this place. Hmm. The 
questions. First is, what's your name? The name is Lillian. People call me Net Picker. I think I have time for questions. And that was actually the second one. Interesting. Okay. Ask her about the cool sword. I was just thinking that. I, I Look, I see someone with a cool sword. I have to ask about it. A nice sword. Does it come with a story? Unfortunately, the factory sold this one with a three-year warranty instead of a story. <laughs> it's to intimidate folks, mostly. <laughs> okay, I like that. It's to intimidate. It is imposing. It's a regular mass-produced sword, like a shovel or an axe. Nothing fancy, just for intimidation. Why do you need intimidation tactics? From time to time, people need a lesson in respect. That's just the way it is. Back in the day, I caught the eyes of many men. <laughs> and believe me, men need a lesson in manners from time to time. I like her. <laughs> um, why don't women arm themselves if it's so effective? That's a good question. What makes you think we haven't? <laughs> the truth is that almost everyone in this life is scared and tired and stupid and too dull for that. That goes for men too, but they put on an act for us, pretend like everything's good and living in shit doesn't bother them. Like anyone falls for that. I, I Okay, I was just fucking talking about this. That does not go for real men. It does not go for you. Show her. <laughs> Show her the wonder. I swear to God, this game, I, I, like, uh, Every time I go on a fucking psychology rant, it immediately answers me with like an example of that. It's talking about like wearing a fucking mask facade because we're our our true vulnerable selves are too hard to present. Coach means the expression. I don't want to do that. I, I'm a little bit intimidated by her myself. Most people I've met are scared, yes. I. No one wants to talk about how frightened they are. But only frightened people are really dangerous. And plenty of them are dangerous. She's not afraid, however. Does that make her not dangerous? No, I, th I think it does. I think it makes her dangerous. <laughs> Can I borrow the sword? Probably not. Let's just see what she says. No, yeah. I'm afraid not. Attempting to confiscate the blade I used to keep these animals in check. You would put me in an early grave. She refuses, but your word is the law. <laughs> you are law. <laughs> I like her. I, she's, she's very straightforward. But at the same time, that feels like its own kind of deceptive tactic. Some went to patch their wounds, their lesson learned. Others were more thick-headed, and one of them, I ended up marrying. Uh-oh. Why, if they're so thick-headed? Guess I enjoyed the way he bled. <laughs> Dang, okay. If it is, then why the melancholy? I feel like she could kill me. Where's your husband now? Gone. Like, gone where? To the waves. <laughs> the sea took it. It was a long time ago. Oh, let's say no more and wait for her to continue. He didn't respect the sea. Went out there, drunk like a skunk, and sure enough, one day, the boat was found floating empty. The bloated corpse turned up two weeks later. Okay, um... Suspicious. Now, before you tell me how sorry you are for my loss, know that it was four years ago, and I've moved on. There's only so much mourning you can do for a drunk with sinewy muscles. Fair enough. She really likes those muscles, though. It's in the way she pronounces sinewy. Hmm. Time is really the best cure for sorrow, isn't it? Us working folk don't have the luxury to be bedsick with melancholy. I buried him, 
mourned for an appropriate amount of time and went on. It's very calculated, though. It's a, it's a little, a little uh, emotionally tart. Life didn't really change that much for me and the kids. Hmm. In some ways, I, this is a a common defense mechanism as well. You hear people, the, the verbiage that they use sometimes, like when someone's experienced something that is like really quite traumatic for them and they have done some moving on from it, of course, like it's, it's maybe not impairing her like basic life functioning, but it does seem like, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, still a lot of emotional depth to this issue for her. Sometimes I'll hear people say like in a very kind of like, I don't know, like static way that she's saying like what she's talking about is very intense. Like my husband died and I had to move on, but she's saying it very like intellectually, not emotionally. You can hear people is the, the verb that they use is, a, is sometimes a defense mechanism. People will say, oh, well, that trauma doesn't bother me anymore in a very similar way. Yes, you know, uh, so-and-so in my life was murdered or, you know, this horrible thing happened to me and what doesn't bother me anymore? I'm thinking, okay, well, bother is an interesting verb. The use of that word helps us put distance between the real emotional content there and, like, the way we're talking about it because, like, to something that bothers you is, like, a stone in your shoe or a bug flying around your ear like those things bother you a trauma is not it's not really the word for a trauma which is like a deeply affecting event but using that language allows us to sort of like make it make sense to us so that we are telling ourselves we don't have to engage with it so deeply um and just the way she's talking about this is kind of similar like preemptively interrupting our pity for the for her um there's only so much mourning you can do that that to me sounds like the conclusion someone has come to when they have struggled to really figure out what to do about mourning like how can i mourn this person anymore i've done the rituals i've spent the time i'm i'm doing everything i can and the feeling's not getting any better so we change our perspective about it we we become just very accepting and try to develop a neutral posture towards the event. Us working folk don't have the luxury to be bed sick with melancholy. Like she's, she's justified her circumstances as telling her, well, you don't actually have time to mourn for this. Maybe you don't deserve to. There's quite a lot there in her presentation and, the, and it's just the language that she's using that's really interesting. Life didn't change that much for me because she's downplaying this a lot. Um, her husband's death. As she longingly watches the waves that she lost him to. This is neither a touchy nor a very interesting topic for her. What did I just say? What did I just fucking say? Strangely neutral. In a very defense mechanism-y kind of way. She looks like she's ready to go on a date with another, better, drunk. Ask her. Both of you could need some action. I don't... That, that, seems, that seems like it would be uh, inappropriate. Do it! Hit on the widow! It's the right thing to do! Okay, I think I fucking hate the, the necktie. Don't, uh, yeah, <laughs> and not only would I <laughs> completely fail at this, but I don't want to anyways. That's, that sounds like a fucking asshole thing to do. Um, I'm going to take this fucking tie off as soon as I can, because I think it's annoying. Um, what do you do around here? Like I said, fish mostly. Sail the waves, take care of the kids, pick nets. Right now I'm tarring a little skiff. What else? I sell the fish to people in the Delta to serve at their fancy restaurants. 
authentic insulin Indian cuisine. Is that enough to make a living? Sometimes I also walk to the beach to see what the sea has given up. The sea is full of surprises. This is what is called a conversation. You don't have to be guarded right now. But what if I am? <laughs> my, my defense mechanism is the flashlight. But it's very overt that that's how we protect ourselves. Uh, interesting. What have you found? Well, you're you could be fucking compromised. Suggestion. I've been down this road before. Charm men and women play the puppet master. I, I, she could be fucking, you know, lying to me like Classia was. How? It's, see what I mean? See what I mean? I I've got my like internal like. Uh, how can I trust anybody? Mask on. Wood, pieces of glass. Every once in a while, we see dead bodies. Human, animal, fish, other odd sea creatures. A mine washed ashore once. I wonder if she saw uh, us crash. Bottles, drugs also. Lost cargo in general. Most of the time, it's just wood and glass. All right. Major choice moment. You only get to ask one thing. It would be weird to say them all. Choose wisely. Rhetoric. You've been chiming in a lot lately, uh, Rhetoric, when you're the one who so desperately failed me with Kalasia. Okay. I'm not going to ask about the drugs. I'm not going to ask about the mine. I need to know about those human bodies. And we got to solve this murder. Well, you're barking under the wrong tree then, officer. I have no interest in floaters. Seen enough of them in my life already. Very unattractive bunch. Yeah, maybe stay clear of the things reminding her of the floater she used to be married to. Just saying. I, I didn't fucking call her... I didn't say the word floater. <laughs> I need to know about them because it's pertinent to the case I'm looking for someone maybe you can help let's see who are you looking for um, um a working class oh that's right there's uh, several people missing let's talk, let's ask about Elena's uh, husband uh I don't think I know what these are care to elaborate <laughs> People who look for animals who are hard to find, who look for mainstream scientists deny exist. Let's just say, let's just be kind. We'll be kind to Elena. Poor Elena. That's all she's got in the world is this cryptozoology thing. Aha, like snowmen. Yeah, snowmen. Two old guys have been wandering around here, nose in sand, talking nonsense about snowmen and the like. The like? Right. Not only snowmen, also green men, monkey men, burning rhinos. You get the picture. Where did they go? I don't really know. Further down the peninsula, I guess. I mean, that's where they were heading. Who else are you looking for besides snowmen? A working class husband. Yeah, I'm not really looking for that anymore. Not much into the middle class ones either. Could do with some landed gentry. But apparently they don't make those anymore. The husband isn't for me. I'm looking for him for his wife. Wish I could help you with that, but I haven't seen your working class husband. Maybe I can help you find someone else. She seems genuinely sorry for not being able to help you. I, how can I trust you, Empathy? I, I feel hesitant to believe their suggestions at this point. But maybe she's genuine. Okay, I'm not looking for anyone else. Anymore. Well, how can I assist you then, officer? Um, oh, let's ask about the signature. Well, let's ask about the boat first. Sure is. The sun, I call her, coated with a fresh layer of tar just yesterday. It'll take some time for it to dry, assuming the sunny days continue. Sunny days, as we catch a snowflake. Hi. Sunny days. You got a problem with that? Please don't stab me with your sword. No, ma'am. We have no quarrel with sunny days. Thank you, Kim. Good. 
month would have been bad news had it turned out it wasn't a sunny day. Bad news for the skiff, bad news for the nets, bad news for the kids. Bad news for me. There's a moment's silence. She looks at the slushy snow melt on the yellow belly of the boat. When do you think the boat will be ready? In time, when the sea turns and the winds settle, she will be ready. Waves wash the sand. A skiff moves across the mirror's smooth sea, far away from here. A lone passenger, a fast sloop in the distance. White sails. God damn, I love shovers. Uh, let's ask about the signature. I don't know if she'll go for it. Are you? Hmm. This says by signing, I agree to living with construction noise. What exactly is the union building? She's very perceptive. She probably got those perceptive boots on. Uh, Everett's planning to turn some of the village into a youth center, which I'm not actually really a fan of. What a nice idea. Wouldn't have thought that. Thought what? That Everard and the Union have nice plans for anything. I thought they only cared about themselves. Well, I guess Union members have children too. I'm very conflicted. I don't like Everard Claire very much at all. And um, I don't really want to start impressing his like designs on other people. I don't really know what it is I'm suggesting by getting these people to sign it. I kind of forget at this point. <laughs> it was so long ago. I'm making a youth center. No, fuck I ever, Claire. Don't sign the papers. Aye, oh, if you say so. Probably better that way. I mean, who likes construction noise? I'll tell you what, I don't. Well, at least we can come back to it. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, leave. Thank you for the nice chat, Lillian. Dude, yeah, fuck Everett Claire, man. He, he's, a, he's a snake in the slippery grass. Hunting stone. White curtains, no one looking in. Dust-covered linens. Dried tulips. Ah, some trousers. What do we got here? Plus one to Kingdom of Consciousness. What was that? Um, I don't think we've discovered that one yet, so... Hang on to those trousers. Makeshift fire pit with magazines for lighting. Okay. There's some more cash lying around on the ground. Always happy to scope that out. You know what? I think I I don't need the crowbar right now. I'll tell you what I do need. I need my, my tear bag. So that I can cash myself up. Wait, what's in these what's in these barrels? Let's give them a peek. Preptide. Okay. Um, anything to do with this bench? The worn and beaten wooden planks of the bench do not look overly comforting. Hmm. We can sit on benches after we've solved the murder. Okay. Let's go. You can revisit the bench if you ever need to pass the time when Lieutenant Kitsuragi is gone. Okay. It's good to know. I like the narrator or the tutorial voice. She sounds... Very, uh, welcoming. Ah, yes, I knew the tear bag would come in handy. Okay, let's, uh, talk to this lady. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
I know this melody. Can't remember what it is, but I know that melody. Welcome to the fishing village. Please lean in closer. I have cataracts. Then how does she know you're here? Uh, <laughs> I love the idea that reaction speed is like on high alert for this like hard of seeing old lady. You don't need to be so defensive, man. Uh, she probably heard us, or maybe, maybe even when you can't like see very well, you can notice shifts in light. She probably noticed the fucking flashlight we're blasting on everybody. Let's lean forward. Oh. Welcome, police officer. We don't cause any trouble around here. And we don't want any trouble either. We are not here to cause any trouble, madame. Oh, look how, like, uh, high-pitched Kim's voice went. It's like... It's so nice. Trouble? Say the second thing, Bratan! Shows you got stuck. Oh, fucking hell, I always forget. I I'm taking you off immediately after this conversation. I, I already forgot. We, uh, we don't cause trouble, we take care of trouble. Oh, of course. Last time we saw you around here was 12 years ago. You also came to take care of trouble then. Wish you did. But still, in Martinez, you're considered an ill omen. Is that right? Have I been here before, or you just mean RCM generally? No, not you personally. Oh. I meant the RCM. Some of the men got into a fight. One of them killed another. Locked himself in that woodshed over there. He was boarding. Needed some help opening the door. You got it open for him, and took him to think about what he'd done in a more secluded place. Somewhere more quiet. What kind of ill omen are we talking about? Oh, the usual. Dark tidings. Black Hound. That's you, all right. A Black Hound licking your own heels. I am an ill omen, all right. You're not. No one around here considers us an ill omen. People would have told us. Hey! <laughs> Kim, you're the only person in my life who is supporting me this way right now. Maybe they are afraid. <laughs> because you're an ill omen. But you're still welcome here. As long as men with guns aren't chasing you. I don't even and have a gun. even then. Because that's the kind of fishing village we've built. I'm sorry there's not a lot of room to park the motor carriage. And not a lot of houses. Or a lot of people. My kids are long gone, searching for treasure. So are others. Ah, look at me ramble on. What brings you to us? Um, what is in this fishing village? She's gonna say fishing. Just us. It's barely a village anymore. We almost don't exist. What do you mean? This is pretty much a non-place. A gap. A blank spot on the map. Just a cluster of nameless shacks on a nameless street. It's quite the um, worldview. Uh, there's going to be something here. Over there, you can find more of the same. Shacks and trees growing wild. That's the pox. Between here and Jamrock, a dusty sea of old trees, all covered in industrial soot. Small houses under them, an overgrown park. The Pax, what is that? An old military hospital and its surroundings. Or oh, it used to be, during the time of the suzerain. After the war, it was turned into a goodwill hospital for shell shock veterans and folks looking for some quiet in the old sanatorium gardens. Now the area is crisscrossed with nameless streets and makeshift cinder block houses. Shacks as far as the eye can see. Hmm. What happened to the hospital? 
the goodwill ran out. The staff left and the place was shut down. It's long gone by now. Man, yeah, this has got to do something to your, like, I don't know, to your... Your sense of place is so important to, like, your internal self as well. Like, just knowing where you live, what it's called, how to communicate that place to someone else. Like, most of the time when I'm meeting someone new, like, the most important thing that I can tell them is, like, where I'm from and... um or that's usually what they ask, like, where, you know, where are you from? And having that narrative is so central to, like, communicating the core of my identity, right? Which is that I'm from the United States, but I'm not really from, from where I was born. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, but I moved away when I was two years old. And, and then I've lived, like, uh, you know, on different sides of the country i've lived in like east coast states west coast states like i've bounced around a lot and i've also spent a lot of time in baltimore so it's not that i'm like totally unfamiliar with it but i'm like i have a hard time saying i'm like from there like communicating that that's my the place that i was born doesn't really say much it, it you couldn't read in and say oh well you're from baltimore that explains why you're like this because i didn't grow up there I've been there lots of times, you know, visiting family and spending time, but I've never like lived there, right? Um, and then you have the whole mess of like me moving overseas and spending 10 years in Europe. And it's like, that's where I feel like my personality came online, but I'm not from there. So I think like, I have a really hard time communicating who I like who I am as part of where I come from but it's the closest thing I can get to being like okay well if I seem like kind of a fucking mess of ideas and personality types it's probably because I've just been all over the place and never settled anywhere and so that's given me a lot of worldliness let's say like just I've seen a lot of you know different ways to live and whatever else um but it's also made it hard to connect to anywhere in particular because I don't stay f anywhere for very long. So having an identity to the place that you live is really important for communicating who you are. And I can only imagine how hard that is when the place that you live in has like such a, a rich history like Martinez does or Revishal does. But a lot of that history is war torn and a lot of the ways it's passed down is just through spoken word it's a very different thing to say like oh i grew up in this city and i spent time going down these streets versus like i oh i live over there i don't know what it's called it's just a place and I feel like that's part of like what the pale as well represents in this world, which is just this this recession of like attachment and identity to places and things. Those those essential uh, threads that we use to communicate narrative and meaning and intention. And as those things recede from consciousness, both literally in the case of like. Um, what she's talking about, but also metaphysically in terms of things slipping into the pale. It's like, who do you end up being when you can't say, this is this is where I come from. This is who I am. Or even to say, well, this is where I come from, but that has nothing to do with who I am because it's, it could also, you know, not be a big part of that, right? Um, which is like in my case... I don't know. It's an interesting subject. It 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 leaves me like feeling quite somber about the the condition of someone's like uh like psychological security to to not have those things. 
Because like, even though I don't feel connected to like, where are you from as a question, I at least have these things that I can communicate and say, well, look, these are all the places I've been. And none of them really represent me or capture me. B but make your best guess. So it's really interesting. Uh, who else lives in this village? Well, there's Lillian and her kids. Met Lillian. Like These Lillian a lot. folks live in the house to the east. But they are away right now. And then there's the drunks. Not a pretty sight. But there's little we can do about it. Home is home. Even for them. Met Lillian. Lillian is tough. Same stuff. Tougher than the men here at least. If it wasn't for her and the kids, this place wouldn't have a spark of life left. I haven't seen any drunks yet, though. Sooner or later, you'll see for yourself. Don't have to look long to find these guys. Is there a way to make a little money around here? I'm not going to ask that. <laughs> I don't think that there. I don't think that there's a way to make money around here. There's another topic. At, well, let's just ask. Here for yeah, you. Yeah, I know it. No officer. The only money we have here is some coins the drunks try hiding from their women and then forgot about. Yeah. Under carts, boats, in little boxes. It's not hard to find. We'll find it. <laughs> we'll, we'll find it. We need, we need to. We're desperate for cash. All right, there's another topic I'd like to address. She nods, rinsing another piece of cloth. Uh, is there anywhere I could stay around here that's not the whirling in rags? Who's going to fucking upcharge me? Stay? Most people here are trying to leave. That said, if lodgings is what you're looking for, ah. I've got a free room in the shack. How much is it? I won't charge you for it. Take it as a gesture of goodwill from the village to the RCM. Um, there's this guy who makes me give him money every night just so I don't die out in the cold. Hmm, that's exactly how they get ya. That is how they that's get ya. That's why we built our own cinder block houses on the seaside. So we don't have to give money to those crooks. We might not look like much. But they are ours. I love you, washerwoman. You're you're freeing me from the f confining shackles of capitalism. You've got yourself a tenant. Don't make an old woman regret opening her house to the police. Fuck you, Gart. Well, if you are not in the hostel in the morning, I'll know where to find you. Here, in a shack. He's a little relieved you're no longer in that room. Me too. Finally, you have those lamos of Martinez off your back, Bratan. This looks like a great place Shut to up. Break shit. Shut the fuck up. I, I hate the necktie. What the fuck? It's so grating. And it's so vulgar. It's just like a fucking loud dude, bro. Asshole. I need to get out of this conversation so I can take that fucking thing off. What's wrong with the ghost? Not much. There's the abandoned church, the Dolorian Church of Humanity. It's been there since before my time, even. Why is it abandoned? Some things just don't fly, officer. Look around. Who'd go to church here? They built it 300 years ago. Must have been nicer then. Well, we've, we've heard about the church in different shivers moments, I believe. So... They don't hold services there anymore. The Ecclesiastes. No, we've tried, but things just keep happening. Crime, accidents, other things. The place never stays open. It's a pity. It used to be such a nice church. She's not telling you all she knows. Keep her talking. Hmm, what else is down the coast? Or let's just, let's, let's ask her what else is going on. Well, there's that music. Music from across the sea. <laughs> it started a few days ago, and now it's blasting, even through the night. And now, suspicious-looking people are sneaking around the church. 
I don't like that. Hmm. Perhaps the mysterious music is somehow connected to the case. A Rusalka or a half demonic Apsura singing. The case, you say? What else is down the coast? Before you get to the church, there's some ruins, an apartment complex, or some kind of electrical plant. Run down bunch of houses. Empty. Which is it? Apartments or electrical plant? I don't know exactly. A pre-war place. It used to be something. Before the war. I wasn't here then, you know. Was born in Samara. Anything else of note? Of note? The old fish market up on the boardwalk. But it's closed. So despite talking a lot already about, like, place and identity and uh, th things having names to communicate um, like r what relates us to a place the, the the place that she's talking about has so much character like just because it doesn't have street names I, I feel an immediate sense of place in this village like just from Lillian and her 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 whole demeanor like it's it's been forged in this environment and it's been forged to survive in it and in some ways thrive in it and then you come over to someone here who has a lot of historical knowledge about this place and says like yeah you know this place is uh staying together partly because of people like Lillian and I just think man this place has immeasurable levels of character despite it, uh, its history languishing, let's say. Who'd want to come to a fish market here? No one. That's why it's closed. It was once a bustling place, back when I was young, and so was everyone else. Now, what catch we do bring in goes straight into a lorry for the Delta or somewhere else. Uh, okay. There's got to be more along the coast. What? You are one of those real estate people with big plans? No. If you want a development opportunity, you can check out the abandoned building over at Lensen. Used to be a supply depot, we think, sending goods and ammo across the bay. It's jammed shut, though. We tried to get in, see if there was anything to sell or scavenge, but it's impossible. Hmm. Well, we got a crowbar. We could find our way in. And now you know everything there is to know about this coast. Interesting. Tell me about yourself. Me? No one. Just an old washerwoman. Mother called me Isabel, if that's what you're asking. And my married name is Sadie. That's what's so interesting to me. It's like, if you were to meet a stranger... Many times, like, our first question for them is, like, what's your name, you know? And someone's name doesn't really tell you much about them. It's not like, okay, if I told you I was from Maryland, you, you could, like, start to put some things together. Like, oh, okay, well, this is the climate that you may have been exposed to. And these are some of the cultural markers of that region. And uh, there's an accent and there's a history to that. There, you can like start to infer socioeconomic status. Like you can start to put together a lot of things with like where someone is from. It's it's pretty natural that that's the first thing we ask. You ask someone's name though. Like if I tell you my name is Brady, there's much less like tangible, uh, projective reference you could draw from that. Maybe you could say, okay, well, w in what cultures is that name prominent? Um, you know, at, at what era in history was that like a popular baby name? Like maybe there's some things you could do, but like less tangible. You would be just making assumptions. But for whatever reason, it's like very important to us to know people's names, even though it doesn't give us any sort of like broader context. It's just that we need we need that. You immediately become someone more memorable to me when I know your name. Um, which is why it's interesting that she's like, what? My name? Well, I have this. My, this is what my mom called me. And, and like when I got married, this was my name. But like, why are you asking? This is really interesting. 
Now it's your turn, Mr. Like she already knows everything about us that she needs to, to have this conversation. We're with the RCM. We need a place to stay. We've got a cool flashlight and a hat. Uh, Kim is our like uh, babysitter, basically. <laughs> like she, you, she can already infer a lot of this stuff, but she wants to know our name. And now this is an interesting thing as well. We just learned our rank and title, and I feel like our character is in the. Uh, He's in the process of allowing himself to welcome who he was back into his life. And and we're we're trying not to reject that anymore. This this moment with Kim and the um carriage was so profoundly impactful to like me as the character and just me in general that I, I now feel safe without the mask of the super cop. And and I don't feel like so discouraged by this name anymore because as I was talking about there are things about Harrier Dubois that um, we can actually look to as virtuous or values that we align with now Lieutenant Double Yefreiter Harrier Dubois first time we're saying it out loud why the handle you got there so many titles. One of them, double. <laughs> I love that idea. Like, I, I'm just going to start uh, saying that when I share my credentials. Like, Brady, Burn, Masters, uh, Licensed Associate Double Counselor or whatever. Like, I don't know. Double Therapist. She's got a couple of ranks herself, on a chief and so on. Really? Okay, I'm not asking for her signature. These people don't give a fuck about Evrar, and I'm not going to help him d develop a fucking... I'm not going to let him gentrify this area. Tremble. The time is now. Taola. What time? Time for the show. For Taola. The hallowed time of fear and disintegration. A countdown has begun. All will collapse on itself. The world will disappear into a single grain of blackness. All sound will be muted. All life will scream. Jesus, this is like my nightmare. It's like an existential apocalypse. What is the Taota? Unogu Theodos, Xino Zausin, Ipoli Osidian, Ehondes Fronisin. When did this countdown begin? Monday morning. The moment you arrived in this reality are the first crack in the sheer face of God. From you it will spread. This is because of the insane world ending I've been saying, isn't it? We'll indulge this. I'm kind of curious. Yes. You spoke the words of the Palindropos and the houses of Pericarnassus. Items, people, even words will tumble. All will lose its meaning in the coming years. That is why you marked yourself. <laughs> am, I, am I sure it's not so sad joke or some kind of coping mechanism? We've talked about coping mechanisms. It's totally also a coping mechanism. I'm a little afraid. So you should be. The world island crumbles at your feet and in the far plain, Palindropos. Perhaps. Just a thought. This has something to do with the hangover. Yeah, probably so. I'm going to opt in just because I'm curious to explore that as a psychological idea. I do think the world might have... The face of the woman fractures. There will be herd killing. We all become vapor. Cop of the apocalypse. A rambling madman. You woke up in a hotel room and started rambling about the end of the world. It's not your normal everyday doom crying either. Something truly colossal is approaching. The gloaming. 
the calling, the bloodletting of unimaginable proportions. Until now, you've been pleasantly vague about the precise nature of this cataclysm. No more. Put the bloodletting on the burner and really figure out what's threatening the fragile physical reality you just found yourself in. Um, well, <laughs> we'll come back to that. Maybe we'll do something with that at some point. Could be interesting. Um, super interesting conversation so far in this area. Really like Lillian and um, the washerwoman. Like I said, just this just like immediately gives me a sense of place despite her testimony that it's like a part of the world that's been forgotten. So we're here. Oh, it's a giant egg. Why is there a giant egg? I guess we'll find out. Okay, I guess we're going to explore up this way. What the fuck is back there? What the fuck? There's so much to this game. I, I, I'm i like never going to finish this game. Okay, I, I'm going to fucking... I'm going to pause it here. I, I am determined to speed up this playthrough. Not at the expense of, like, um, you know, the quality of the commentary or anything, but, like, I... I am starting to sense some momentum in the, the narrative now that I'm like off of that um, initial part of it. So yeah, we're gonna keep going. Uh, I'm curious, I'm gonna go talk to those kids over there and hopefully we have a better outcome with them than we did with Kuno. So that's gonna do it for this episode. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.